thank you thank you for those joining us um, i'm sure more people will join during uh, the next five ten minutes um class has put together this event today called back to school 2020 we were thinking uh with everything that's happened over the last few weeks um and in fact last few months um and how much is still up in the air that this would be a good opportunity to speak to people like kevin courtney who's the joint uh, general secretary of the national education union national education union and um, people like pippa who's a teacher on the ground academics campaigners um young people who have larissa who's the president of the national uh, uh union of students um and just to really get a sense of what's happened where we are what we need to be fighting for now going forward um, what plan is or isn't in place in regards to safety in young people and students returning school but also more generally about tackling the inequalities and all of the signs are that covid and the lockdown um, and the inability for young people and children to um, access online education depending on where they are in the income spectrum has made um, aspects of educational inequalities even worse um, and so we really do need to have a clear plan in place over the next year to deal with the existing inequalities and the new inequalities that have been created over the last few months um, so so we've got quite um a group of speakers today so i'm going to get going quite quickly um just to say as well it does feel and i would urge the speakers um you know it does feel that we are constantly firefighting and we're constantly just fo focusing on the problem that lays right in front of us so we are going to take the time to start with um jessica abrahams who's um a lecturer at bristol university on social justice and education to really give us a sense of those inequalities and what the algorithm um, really highlighted about the system, that it wasn't something just divorced from the way in which education works currently. Uh, we want to make sure that we hear from young people and that we hear from those of you on the call. So we will bring you in as soon as possible. So I'm going to be really strict on timing to all of the speakers. Um, we're going to have five minutes each and then we'll open up to discussion um, and come back to the speakers again. Um, and I know it's it's a uh, what tuesday evening um and i want to thank everyone for joining us on this for this important discussion um okay great so let's start with uh jessica dr jessica abrahams who's a social justice and education lecturer at bristol university jessica thank you um okay so um i this is quite hard to do in five minutes just to because this the things that are happening right now have just illustrated a whole load of inequalities that people in the in a lot of areas have been writing about and speaking about for a long time and sociology of education which is kind of the area i'm speaking to this from is a big part of that and has been a big ever since i've been doing sociology this is huge um so yeah, just forgive me, I'm going to be having to do this very quickly, but I did want to have a couple of slides because there is something I want to show you, but ah, now, you can see my slides, right? Okay. We can see it, we can see it, thanks. Great, um, but it's not covered up by my notes now, right? Sorry about this. Okay, so um, in the talk today, I really want to focus specifically on the explicit and conscious reproduction of an unequal ranking of pupils and schools um, and pose an alternative way that assessment standardization processes could have been altered, um, could have been done to alter hierarchies in the name of social justice. Can I just ask, I think you can put it in, if you put it in slide mode. Ah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. I just think I won't be able to see my notes. That's the only problem. So um, if I do that, let's see. Yeah, I can't just do that. Sorry about that. You'll have to. OK, so basically, um, in the interim report on awarding qualifications in the summer of 2020, Ofqual stated here on the slide, um, this is a direct quote, the standardization process applied to assessments is not intended to reduce existing inequalities, but it should not widen or for that matter narrow existing attainment gaps by introducing assessment bias into the process beyond what may be considered natural variation. Okay, I think that quote should just sit for a minute. So 
proposals for awarding qualifications for the 2019 to 2020 cohort explicitly acknowledge that the UK's unequal attainment gap, um, they acknowledge that it exists and they note that this means that assessment bias is likely to be rewritten into the algorithm that they've constructed to control for grade inflation. But um, as Ofcourse quote up here makes clear, the UK's assessment standardization process was never intended to correct for educational inequalities. Um, but the, and the maintenance of a historical attainment gap was accepted as long as it was contained within the remit of natural variation. So the questions I want to pose today and just for us to take away with, I'm not going to necessarily answer all of them, is what is meant by natural variation? And why was the standardization process not actually intended to narrow attainment gaps if we accept that they exist and that they are based on inequalities? Um, and how and why has the standardization process exacerbated existing inequalities, which I think that we know that it's done. And that's something that I haven't actually come here to tell you all of the ways it's done that, but I'm hoping other speakers will also speak to this issue. Um, so they've said that it wasn't intended to, but I think that it has. Um, and how has it been allowed to do that? Okay, so in thinking about what's meant by natural variation, I would argue that the attainment gap has become naturalized. So it was deemed acceptable to reproduce it mathematically. Um, so whilst we can celebrate the overturning of the cruel policy of downgrading, we must be cautious that there are still layers of inequalities and bias, like I said, being exacerbated using assessment and center grades, center assessed grades. Um, but also what's been less discussed, which I want to talk about right now, is the issue that all upgrades that were made through the application of the government's algorithm were upheld. And in fact, the algorithm that was overturned was applied still to GCSE rankings in England after this U-turn, specifically to upgrade some of them. Well, that's the information I've heard. Now, we, thank you, Kevin. We can now ask, does natural variation include, um, sorry, I'm getting lost here, the already upgraded being further upgraded. So bearing in mind the algorithm has upgraded in line with the historical performance of a school. So is it okay to reproduce advantage because we expect it to occur naturally? And how does this fit with Gavin Williamson's comment on standardizing outcomes to ensure that too many young people are not overpromoted past their capabilities? I've been looking for the exact words, sorry that if they're wrong, but something along those lines. So what Gavin Williams is not acknowledging here is that young people's potential to demonstrate their capabilities is always influenced by their class, race and gender background and a lot more issues as well. Um, so I want to ask why the standardization process was not intended to reduce existing inequalities. Okay, so let's put aside this commitment to not exacerbating inequalities because we know that hasn't been honored. That's something, <laughs> I close the door for a second. But I wanna focus the attention on the fact that this algorithm constructed was openly intended to reinforce a hierarchical society, one based on measuring pupils against each other in a manner which unfairly privileges some groups over other. So this is what we know that high stake examinations usually do and there's evidence to show how they reproduce uh, bias and inequality. But um, under normal circumstances, the attainment gap that gets reproduced as an outcome is upheld by the myth that we live in a society where anyone can make it if they are intelligent and they work hard enough. And this is called meritocracy. So this means that if we accept that young people receive unequal results as they're deemed to be a product of their own efforts and ability. So sociologists, including myself, have long demonstrated myth the mythical elements to this discourse through evidencing that young people are not competing on a level playing field. So today, under COVID, with examinations cancelled, even the myth of meritocracy is dead. Assigning outcomes for never to be sat exams was always going to be a challenge, but the option this government went for was cruel. The plan, standardising results already based on potentially biased, um, and I've heard some things about arbitrary in the rankings, um, to force them into a typical bell curve to fit previous outcomes of previous cohorts would mathematically reproduce the historical attainment, attainment gap um, as understood as a product of structural inequality and do nothing to intervene. Sorry, so, Jessica, can you just like yeah. move on to your slides a bit? Just because we're oh, sorry. It. It's only what do you want me to do? Move on to the next slide. That's just for the end. I can stop sharing. I'm very nearly finished now. Okay, great. Go on. 
Okay, so um, this is those were for the final point. There, yeah, so I think there are many alternative provisions that could have been made to address systematic inequalities. And if we're committed to social justice, there is a need to challenge the reproduction of privilege. So we need to find an acceptable way to talk about moving people down and not to downgrade based on historical disadvantage. We need to downgrade for privilege and upgrade for disadvantage. And this could have been done. We could have constructed an algorithm which engineers equity, upgrades to account for systematic structural institutional bias and inequality. And this is a fact that's acknowledged by Ofqual, where they highlight, and they move forward here. Um, oh, sorry, that's not quite here. Um, but they highlight that they considered making these corrections to their standardizing model to account for bias. Um, and they, like I said at the beginning, but as they've openly stated in the initial quote, they never intended to reduce inequalities. As such, they decided not to make this correction, arguing that such an intervention would be unprecedented in the history of qualifications in England. And that's an intervention to correct for, to, to address the attainment gap. So if the, the question now is, if it's not even acceptable, Next slide. It's not even acceptable to alter our assessment and qualifications processes in the name of equity and social justice during unprecedented times. When will it be acceptable? Thank you. Um, I've just left it on this because I don't know how many of you have seen this, but I've definitely seen the equality and equity a lot. Um, and a bit of the reality. Now, I just think this cartoon captures everything I try to say here, really, that, you know, there is a big, I think, difference between people's understandings here of equality and equity and where the starting points are. But if you look at reality, um, and liberation is another option. So, yes, thank you. I will stop sharing my screen, I guess. Let me work this out. Thank you, Jessica. That was really excellent. I really appreciate you um, giving us those quotes and those slides just to really remind us of the um, absolute uh, contradiction we have in this government's so-called um, focus on social mobility meritocracy, which of course we know is a myth, but even in their agenda to level up. Um, in fact, what we saw with the algorithm was an effort to level down and even with the U-turn, um, we still have a hugely unequal system and we are, as I'm sure Kevin will pick up, as we enter a new year um, of education whereby, you know, obviously a lot of young people and children have just missed um, four or five months of education. Um, or have not been had as much ex access as each other. I know from people that go send their kids to private schools versus not that, you know, those in private schools that have more resources have been able to do more online um, as opposed that that don't. And so, you know, the algorithm and the inequality it produces, it's not the end of it of that story yet. And again, as next year's results uh, will come out, there'll be all kinds of questions all over again because of the way in which um, education has been affected from COVID, but this reluctance to really try and do what the government said they were going to do, which was to level up. Um, so here we are in this dilemma. And I think one of the things that we really need to understand and that has been missing from this conversation is really how um, the, the race element of this, this discussion, and in particular, um, what happens with teacher assessment grades um, and the way that which the algorithm works, given that we know that um, children from minority ethnic communities, especially black children, are disproportionately, uh, black and Bangladesh and Pakistani children are disproportionately in low income households and also the subject of, you can call it unconscious bias or, you know, other types of ways in which prejudice works through the system. Um, and so really pleased to have Zara Bay join us, who um, I met some time ago at a Black Teachers Conference and who is uh, really a star and um, used to work at a, a local people referral unit to me and has been a teacher for many years and then set up this campaign, No More Exclusions. Um, and I'll let her make the case as to why this is such an important issue. Um, but we really can't forget the injustices of the educational system that existed before COVID. And I know Zara will do a good job at bringing those alive. Thank you, Zara. Thank you very much, Faiza. And thank you, Jess, uh, for laying the ground, doing the groundwork, really. Um, uh, 
really calling out already some of the things that must be flagged up, I think, throughout this event, if we're going to talk about um, inequalities um, in the education system. So um, the case I would like to make is the case for not the winners, not the losers, but the ones that are not, me not even in the race when it comes to exams. And that is the group of people, children, teenagers, um, who are deemed uh, unteachable. Uh, they are deemed um, 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 outside of the norm, uh, which, which is a frame that is given to us by whiteness. Um, and when we're talking about wine, this is really important that we are not, we, we, we are clear that we're not talking about skin color, we are talking about um, a hierarchy um, that sets what, what is normative in education. So um, who gets excluded? We know that disproportionately and historically, this is not, not a new trend. We know we have uh, black children, um, uh, gypsy and Roma traveler children. We've got children who, children who have a whole range of special education on and disabilities sometimes diagnosed but oftentimes undiagnosed uh, uh, who, who are thrown into um, and if they're lucky actually into an alternative provision of pupil referral uni because they often could just be left at home to linger for weeks months and sometimes sometimes even years uh, outside of education um, Jesse was talking about um, the maintenance of a historical attainment gap and how actually uh, the information that was published by the government made it quite plain and clear. I mean, it's, you know, like it's been said to us, it's not even hidden. Um, I think it's, it's pretty much the same with exclusions. There, there, there is no attempt really to hide what it is that is being done. There was a report published by the EPI, and I know I've heard Kevin reference it before and other people uh, in relation to a frolling unexplained exit, the, 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 the report calls them. Um, a whole class, in 2017, a whole, the equivalent of a whole class of 30 children in year 11 that just disappear off roll. Um, what, what is that? Where is that coming from? Where do those children in year 11 end up going? What, what are the outcomes for those young people? We know that um, it's, it's about two in three uh, of young people who get excluded, who will end up getting caught up in the criminal justice system. Um, and we all know, I, I'm sure I don't have to highlight the costs to society, the economic costs, the psychological costs, um, the cost to the families, the child themselves, um, of being caught up in that system. So why do we do it? Um, I mean, it has been highlighted even in Parliament by a brilliant young person called Etienne um, that it is it is actually cheap. It would be actually be cheaper to send a young person to Eton um, than it would be to send them to prison. And yet we are so committed, um, like like Carl Parson says, we have such a will to punish in England. The good news is that that's not the only way uh, that we could be dealing with children who don't fit the norm. Right? What can we do? I mean. There's going to be a segment maybe afterwards, towards the end, uh, I believe, right? We're going to talk about solutions, Pais, am I right? About, yes? You can come back no? if, if you want to say them now. Yeah. Come back to I that. Think, yeah. I think, yeah, I think otherwise we're all going to go away from this super depressed and always talking about all the things that aren't working and not enough about what, what can be done, what can't, we can't do. So what can we do about, um, about the underclass that we are reproducing? Uh, and we are reproducing it completely. Like we have had data, official data on exclusion published by the DFE, highlighting the disparity since 1997, we're in 2020 with COVID these inequalities are only set to exacerbate. Um, we have heard reports of young people being excluded from Zoom lessons. We have heard of uh, the role of online attendance monitoring officers. Um, and obviously we have to think about surveillance education and the, uh, the overreach, right, of our roles as educators into people's homes and into pe in private lives. Um, I mean, there's so much more we can say about this. One of the things that I, I really would like everyone to get behind is the fact that the, the, the current government is absolutely wedded to the ideas that exclusions are an essential part of how we teach, how we administer education. That is not that. In fact, the exact words last year when the Timpson Review was published was that exclusion should be viewed, quote, as the beginning of something new and positive, unquote. So, 
I mean, I, I, I do stutter when I say these words because I can't believe the goal that any politician, that anyone would say. Uh, I mean, and there are many people who obviously uh, support that, uh, that, that feel that exclusions do, do have a role, that punitive measures, that a cultural logic in education play a part, irrespective of the cost to society and to children and families. What we would like to see is a moratorium on exclusion. We would like to see a ban, certainly during this, uh, so-called recovery period uh, where children are going to be in all sorts of funny states of mind um, and I mean my view personally is that this should be a gap year nobody should be going back to, to school actually I think we should take this time to 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 all these reimagining and all these conversations we've had about reinvent education uh, rethink it well where is the time to do it uh, the pandemic has forced us to take some time out, but uh, unfortunately, capitalism can't wait, and we've all been, been pushed back to work. Um, parents and teachers have been put in this impossible situation where we're having to um, work out you know, what level of risk is acceptable to us, our families, our communities, um, and our colleagues. So I, 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 this is what I would like to see. That would be my radical proposition, that nobody goes back to, to school um, and that we use the time to, to overhaul all the structures that are not serving us. I'm going to stop there, Faiza, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, absolutely, we're seeing so much disruption, uh, whether it be to schooling or um, uh, the economy more generally. And rather than using this as an opportunity to build a new normal, um, we are in this ever um, quick race to quickly to just go back to what was normal, which is normal that was delivering really poor outcomes across the economy, education, the health system. Um, and so, you know, in, in these times of disruption, which we didn't ask for, there is an opportunity, though, to make those changes. And we certainly are not we're not seeing that work. And it's extremely frustrating that we're getting all of this pain and we're not gonna have any gains out of it. And that's what it feels like right now. Um, I'm gonna to come to Pippa now. Pippa is a biology teacher in a further education college in London. Um, and we wanted to, we asked Pippa to speak because what we really wanted to get a sense of was what it's been like teaching um, and being a teacher in the last six months. Um, and, you know, what, the concerns are on the ground. Pippa is also a, a union rep within um, her college and, and area. So can you give us a sense of what the concerns are um, within your college? Thanks, Pippa. Okay, hi. So um, I will start by talking about, about what our concerns are, and then I'll go into and some of the details surrounding them. So basically, I can sort of divide the concerns into three. There's like concerns for like year 13 who've just left, um, and the grading process and the inequalities that that has um, brought up and then we've got concern for year 12 going into year 13 who have um, a very very different experience that under lockdown which has sort of widened the equality gap um, and we've got concerns about safety too so I will talk, I will I will talk about all those things um, so to start off with, uh, I'll, I'll talk about year 13 first and the grading and the grading system. Um, I'll talk about our experience. So I think one of the issues that we've got and one of the inequality issues is that this was not done in the same way by all colleges. So even though we've had schools and colleges, so even though we've had a U-turn, um, that hasn't actually addressed the issue. Um, so our, our experience was that we were asked as a team to come up with some grades so each of us as teachers first of all um, looked at our students and came up with a grade for each of the students now the way that i did it and my, my colleagues did it in a, in a fairly similar way was to consider a best case scenario for each student student now we considered that to be a fair thing to do because when your student goes into an exam um, some of the students will get their base case scenario. We know that in a normal situation that some of them won't. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, um, which is why our exam system, where it's an all stakes end of year exam that everything rests on, is totally unfair because 
the, sometimes uh, a big thing that happens with students, a lot of them, is they get bogged down in one question, panicky about it, spend far too much time on it, and then can't finish the rest of the paper. So I haven't really got an opportunity to show what they can do as a result. You know, there's like, granny might be ill, dog might have died, um, someone's thrown themselves under the, under the tube on the way in. All these things, all these things, we know that that, that that happens and that affects our results. So best case scenario, then we, we speak together as a team. Obviously, sort of everybody wants their own students to do well. We know we've got to have some kind of level of sort of um, fairness in there. And sort of we, 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 that's probably like the first bit where a student's grade might come down by one grade. When you actually get together as a team, I know that one of my students, I didn't want to fail any of my students, and my team said, actually, no, these three students, they weren't all mine, but they, one of them was, these three students have never shown that they're going to pass this exam. Okay, right, so we, we agreed. There's, there's five of us, we agreed as a team, we, ca we came up with these grades, and we had A star to U. We had a full range. Um, then we went to the management of the college with our grades, and they looked at them and they went, these don't match the three-year trend. They're nowhere close. You've got to make them more closely match the three-year trend. We refused to do so. We were not the only people who refused to do so, but lots of people did alter their grades before with the management, before sending them off to um, the exam board. Inequality there. Um, what our management then did is they actually changed the grades anyway. We weren't allowed to see them. We only saw them when the grades came out on A-level results day. And then we could see what the college had done to the grades and then what, then what the algorithm had done to the grades. So the, co the college, actually, our grades that we initially um, came up with as a team, um, 47 of our 98 strong cohort had been downgraded by one grade. And that's by, by the college. Um, so that's, about, that's nearly 50%. Um, and the algorithm had downgraded them further, so lots of students had actually gone down two grades. Obviously, that, I mean, the issue now with the algorithm is twofold. A, caused lots of unnecessary stress, and B, it caused lots of students to miss out on exam, uh, on a university places that build up very quickly um, because now they've got too, too many people, not enough space, Etc. Etc. So they might may have, may have to defer a year, which then has an impact on our year twelve. So that's that's what happened. But then we find out this is so unequal. It's not what happened everywhere. And anecdotally, anecdotally, we find that in independent schools with small, small cohorts, that teacher assessment grades were just accepted. So they get their teacher assessment grades. Our students don't. Our, stu our students get a centre assessed grade. We go to a man management saying, this is really unfair. Our students should have the teacher assessed grade. Please can you go to Ofqual and ask whether we can have our teach teacher assessed grades? And they say, no, um, there's a statement from Ofqual which says they are not going to accept any more revisions to um, the grades now. Even though they know these inequalities must exist. And the equalities are our biggest for large sixth form colleges. They're the, they're the ones who got downgraded most by the algorithm. They're the ones where, I mean, I've, I'm a, I've got the, the sixth form network, I'm in touch with other colleges. Most sixth form colleges did alter their grades to meet the three year trend. We partic feel particularly Sorry, angry. Just short, running short on time. Do you want to? Oh, um, right. Okay. So I better, talk, I better talk quickly about concerns then. Um, yeah. So con the concerns um, are year 12. Year 12's varied experience under, under lockdown, all sorts of um, things. Some students working on their phones, some students' relatives had COVID, lots of dip inequalities there, broadband, some didn't have access to broadband, some don't have enough space to work in. Again, the more disadvantaged are the ones that had less access to all the work that we set them over, lo over lockdown. And now Ofqual, there was so little change to the exams. I don't know why they bothered doing these consultations because we all sort of went into that consultation and said we need more time, we need less 
we need choice in the exam, we need less content. And what all Ofqual have done, my subject, biology, all they've done is said you need to do a few less practicals. But we'll still test the students on the practical. So basically that's not helpful at all because the students will un only understand the practical properly if they do it. So absolutely outrageous. We're concerned that not only, you know, have they lost time now, but because there's so many issues over safety and now they're saying like 100% classes in, that we're going to get COVID cases, that we're going to end up with, with classes having to go into lockdown for 10 days, in and out of lockdown all winter. We can see that happening and even more impact on the students learning where they've got to face this un pretty much unaltered exam in 2021. Um, so we're, we're really, really concerned about that. Um, we also got concerns about um, Pearson waiting in the wings, wanting to sort of produce lots of online resources, management selling off buildings to make um, money because their finances are in a mess. Um, obviously assuming that we're going to, lots of people are going to be working at home in the future. We don't want to work at home in the future when all this is over, we want to um, be back at work. Um, um, basically, we're really concerned about all these things. We're concerned about uni, uni places for next year. Do tell me if I've run out of time. Yeah, you have run out of time. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> I'll stop. You're being too polite with me. I'll stop. I'm just, I'm just so, so sort of like it's all like swimming around in my head at the moment. All this, so much of it. Oh, no, I can hear Thank that. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Pippa, for that. And it's really important that we understand that teachers are faced with all of these dilemmas and all of these concerns. Um, and you know, it's quite, it's quite shocking to hear from you that your, what you're hearing back from Ofqual is that the biology A level exam is not really changing. Um, despite young people uh, in your A-level students having, um, you know, had checkered uh, access to education the last five months or so. So, um, I mean, it's, it, it really sets us up for a whole lot of problems um, come the results next year. And I'm hearing myself from um, year, year 12 students as well, but they're worried that ne next year they're going to have more troubles getting into university because all of the young the young people from this year will then uh, who didn't manage to get in but their place is secure for the next year they've just it's just going to be i mean it's just been a shambles um kevin you, hopefully you can help us make sense of it i mean it's been 10 years of very very difficult uh, interventions government interventions in the education system whether they be um, forced academization whether they be austerity and cuts to education you know the end of the school buildings program whether it be goes refor reforms to the curriculum um, whether and we'll talk to larissa in a moment you know when we think about higher ed higher education what's happened to fees um, and the situation for for young people is, you know, you have to look across the last 10 years and really, um, really there's not a lot to celebrate. Um, and as we look forward now to the next year, I guess it would be really good to get a sense of you, not only of, you know, the concerns that you have and, you know, obviously there's huge discussions right now about whether it be face masks and safety and, and getting children back into school. Um, but what we really need to be fighting for come the next year and I know that the NEU has had you know a, a surge in members and and you guys have been fighting the battle hard so I'm going to hand over to you Kevin thank you thanks very much Pfizer thanks for the invitation uh, I mean if people want to talk about those safety questions I'll come back on those in question and answer but I thought I'd like to build on what other people have said and talk about this exam crisis now because clearly the immediate cause of it was the COVID, the, you know, the abandonment of the exams. But I think you have to dig, dig deeper and see the roots of it. And this very much builds on what Jessica and Pippa and, and Zara said as well. Our education system, this I think is part of the root. Our GCSE exams and A-level exams are set up to ration education success. You've got to understand it's a system of rationing that has been built up by the government. So there are fixed percentages of numbers of children that can get each grade each year. So every year, 30% of children fail, do not get a good pass in English. In the language they speak, 30% of children get what is called a failing grade every year. And it's really important to get this bit, no matter how hard 
those students the students work no matter how hard the teachers work every year 30 percent of kids will fail because we have a system that rations exam success and most years that rationing happens all the kids do their exams and then Ofqual sets the grade boundaries on the exam results so that 30 percent of children fail and this year it's been rationed a slightly different way so they've taken all the the teachers were made to as well as grade uh, which they've got some guess some good uh, ways of grading they also had to rank the students and then off call just put cutoffs on those rankings so that again they were aiming at 30 percent of children failing and that fundamentally is wrong with our system we shouldn't be rationing success so we've got to dig deep and we, we should try and change that for the future. Now the immediate problem next year is very much I think that we're going to see an exacerbation of the inequalities. You can imagine when you've got a rationing system like that with 30% of children failing English every year then who is going to lose the race to get the good grades? Every, all the children start they're all trying to get a grade but children who are who are suffering through poverty and inequality they are held back so they predominate in that 30% of failures of, of, of children who failed the GCSE exams and next year Pip has just told you that the, the, the Ofqual want to examine uh, or the government has told Ofqual actually that they have to examine all the content. Now the private schools where kids have been able to where they've been in small groups online with all you know where they've got room at home they will have done lots of the content during lockdown and in other schools children will not have been able to get get some of the content done so if they examine all the content when you have that rationing system those kids who are in the poorer end of the community they will lose out even more we've got to stop that for next year the, uh, my, my union's got a petition out demanding that the, the content is varied there's more choice so that the you, you know pippa can teach certain parts of the a level syllabus so that her kids have got a chance of answering those questions and that's a way of getting equality there but actually we have to change this system which rations success and sometimes we are pointed at uh, our opponents uh, point at us and say you just want everybody to pass you, you say that all should have prizes and that's not our position at all there are much better ways of assessing children assessing people if you look at music grade exams we don't have loads of kids failing music grade exams. What you have is children do their music grade one. When they succeed, they do their music grade two. And it's a ladder of success. The same with a karate belt exam. You don't fail your, 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 your blue belt. You, you do your green belt or whichever one comes first and you progress up uh, a succession. And we need to have a system that's more like that about marking what children have done. That's not saying everyone's done the same, but that, that, that it's a way of marking what children have done. And you have to look at the obstacles that we have to overcome to get to a better system. And I think there are two that really matter. One is that our government is absolutely obsessed with league tables. They want these clean cut as they see them exams in order to rank schools. And this is what I think. When you look at, uh, at league tables, you find that the schools at the top are the grammar schools in the leafy suburbs and the schools at the bottom are in the much more challenging circumstances and what you're actually ranking is not the quality of the school not the effectiveness of the teacher you're ranking the poverty of the children who go to the school and i think the government wants league tables because they want people to believe the reverse they want to blame teachers for the effect of poverty so i think we've got to get rid of league tables because that lets us get to a a better exams a better system of assessing and i think this way that you would assess what children have actually done and say look this is what you've done this is what you need to do to go to the next level that's what you need a teacher for you need teacher assessment to do that and we should be looking for a system that, not with terminal exams like this but based on teacher assessment now there, there is a problem with that that people point to they talk about uh, you know teachers will have different views of how to do that schools will have different views there might be conscious bias or unconscious bias but we know how to cope with that you build a system of moderation so that teachers do the assessment but then you share the the, the, the papers that children have written for you in an anonymous way with a, another group of teachers they look at them they grade them and you get some sense of you get an equality from that so i think we have to say no to a system of examinations which rations success no matter how hard, like I said at the beginning, how, how hard teachers work and children work, 
30% of children fail their English GCSE every year. That's completely wrong. We've got to break down that system to do it. I think we've got to get rid of league tables and build a system of teacher moderation. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that um, excellent intervention and a real idea there, something for us to fight for in terms of the, the league tables and the way in which um, it, the examination system currently works. Um, and we'll talk more about ideas in a moment. And for people that are, you know, listening to this and have questions, um, in a moment um, after Larissa, I'm going to be taking some interventions um, from people. So do be ready. You can go through the participants um, button on your Zoom um, interface and you can put your hand up. So I, and then I'll be taking interventions for people. Great. So last but certainly not least, uh, Larissa Kennedy, who is the president of uh, the NUS um, and lots to speak about from a young person's stroke student's perspective. Larissa. Thanks so much, uh, Pfizer and class, for, for having me. Um, like many students right now, I am exhausted. Exhausted by a government that actively seeks to reproduce classism, racism and ableism in the education system has been, has been said by many of the other uh, contributors this evening. Exhausted by seeing that US pop stars have to step in so that students can have access to the rightful education they deserve. Exhausted because we are continually inheriting an education system that is and long has been rigged. Because if the A-level results scandal has exposed anything, it's just how rigged things are. We've seen a government who were warned about the ways the A-level algorithm would disproportionately impact students from marginalised communities, yet persisted and thought they would get away with it. They thought they would get away with a system where students in the poorest postcodes were being downgraded, which of course translates uh, to disproportionately students of colour as well. You know, one of the students I spoke to went from AAB to EED. Meanwhile, I'm hearing from students at private schools who comparatively were seeing inflation. And now even those students, yes, we won the U-turn, yes, we got out on the streets, we demanded justice, we got the U-turn, but it came too little too late because I keep hearing from working class students, students of colour and disabled students who are being told that the spots for the uni course that they apply to are full despite now rightfully having the, the grades that would have gained them entry. Meanwhile, lots of marginalised students are still yet to see any grades at all. And we know that predictions too have historically reinforced classism, racism and ableism. So that fight isn't over either, but I digress. I think fundamentally the reverberations of this horrific algorithm are going to have, you know, an impact on the demographics of our higher education system that could be immense but are by no means random because for those of you looking at this wondering like how did they get this so wrong because I know a lot of us are in their eyes it wasn't wrong and we have to remember that you know not a single student from Eton was downgraded so in fact it was working exactly as designed this system that has a postcode lottery baked in, as has been said year on year through so-called attainment graphs across FE and HE, while still pushing the myth of meritocracy, this system that means young black men on free school meals with special educational needs are 168% more likely to be excluded from school than their white female counterparts. This system where we've seen universities put out statements claiming that Black Lives Matter with little to no action behind those empty platitudes, despite swathes of complicity and anti-blackness within knowledge production towards black students and workers and towards black folks impacted by this institution's economic, social, political impacts on the surrounding community. So like I said, the system is rigged. And of course, in the here and now, we need to get final grades for all students and ensure that every single student has access to fair and free appeals and resets. But we also believe that it's high time to build a new and radically reimagine education. We need to overhaul our systems of exams and grading to move towards assessment that works for every student in every postcode every single year. And we need an education system that's properly funded, puts people over profit, prioritising the public good education can bring, not the whims of market forces. And we've seen that public good clear as day throughout this pandemic. Students and workers within education have been at the heart of so much good. 
Healthcare staff and students have stepped up to save lives in the NHS. Students have led the way in building tenants unions and mutual aid groups. And our sector is at the heart of leading research, the search for a vaccine, for treatments and for societal solutions to the various crises that lay before us. So now our calls for a free and liberated education system, our calls for justice for education, they land with more vim than ever before. Because coronavirus has just exposed what we already knew, which is that the project of marketization in higher education could hide its ugly head from sight when things were, you know, seemingly okay, when it was just, you know, ticking along and doing this. But now that inherent injustice and instability is exposed for everybody to see. And, and I, fi I think policymakers find themselves forced to explore the benefits of a funded, accessible, lifelong education system that is and should be co-owned by students, workers and communities, because that's the way to rebuild our economy, both locally and nationally. We need access to retraining, to development, to all the things that we need to meet the challenges of the 21st century, from pandemics to climate change. So as I said, I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet because I feel like a lot of the, the key points were made by the prior speakers, but I just, I just want to end on this and then let people know this because as a student movement, we will continue to be radical, to be visionary and to build a grassroots mass movement capable of realising a new vision for education from the rubble of the old. And we really hope that you'll come on that journey with us. Um, but yeah, thank you so much um, for including us. Often we have conversations about students without students. Uh, and so we're grateful to have this space and, and really do concur with a lot of the points made by previous speakers. And I know we're short on time, so I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for that, Larissa. And you know, so much of what we want to hear and, and absolutely you know, seeing young people out you know, really going to the streets and standing up for their rights and standing up for what is right for the rest of us as well, for society. I mean, it was really a sight to behold and certainly is the reason that we saw that U-turn on Monday after, you know, no doubt whilst the Prime Minister was in his Scottish cottage or whatever it was, you know, would have seen uh, the chance of young people in our streets outside the Department of Education. And, and, you know, it's a lot to put on young people because we are giving you a whole lot of crap, really, in my, my language. You know, it's in every way, it's um, really uh, a much more difficult situation, even from when I was 18. So it feels like a long time ago now. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a lot to fight for going forward. And we do need young people um, coming out on the streets as they have been doing, whether it be Black Lives Matter or whether it be about... Um, this algorithm and inequalities in education and hearing uh, young people shout justice for the working class just really just moved me and for so long we have not spoken about class issues and uh, obviously you would expect that I'm obsessed with the issue given that I run uh, a think tank called class but just to say um, you know we're very lucky at class that we have this space to be able to be um, uh, you know, political um, and say what we think. And we, we can do that because of the, the trade unions, because um, people like Kevin Courtney support us, uh, the National Education Union support us and give us funding, Unite, GMB and, you know, CWU, different unions support us and allow us, with give us this space and uh, remind us time and time again that it's the grassroots voices, you know, the students on the receiving end, the health workers, the teachers, uh, the campaigners on at the grassroots that we should be listening to and whose voices we should be elevating. So I just was thinking, you know, whenever I do these events that we are, we're so lucky to have this space and be able to hold these conversations at class. And um, saying that we're going to bring in um, one more campaigner and a young person just to kind of reflect on what they've just heard. Um, and please, other people on the call, do raise your hand and I will take interventions. Um, great, I can see some hands being raised. So um, let's start with, is that uh, Den Henry? Is that, is that you, Denise? Denise? Yeah. Hello. Hiya. Hi. I can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Yes, I'm Denise Henry. I'm primary teacher and union activist, any union activist and a member of CARE. CARE is a collision of uh, anti-racist educators. And my question pr pretty much is, I'm just gonna do a statement, then the question will come after. 
both chaired the Collegian of Anti-Racist Educators and the Black Educators Alliance issued a statement last Wednesday in relation to exam, you know, fiasco that's been going on. The Black Educators Alliance in particular requested that the NEU should look at the following three areas, areas in order to remove racial bias from teachers assessment. One, undertake a full investigation into this matter. Two, produce guidance which acknowledges and challenges teachers racial and cultural bias in teachers assessment. Three, develop immediate and specific support for black students regarding examination appeal processes and institutional teacher assessment. So my question to Kevin Courtney, will the NEU commit to taking racial bias in education seriously and ensuring exam justice is racial justice too? Thank you for that. I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment, Kevin. I'll just take sort of three interventions and then come back to the speakers. Thank you for that, Dennis. Um, Elia York, who is at People Power, do you want to explain a bit about what People Power is? Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm Elia, 17 years old, and I'm an A level student. So again like larissa was mentioning i'm a student who's very frustrated um for reasons that you can all imagine um people power is a youth-led movement aiming to challenge young people to reimagine what the 21st century education system could be and actually take action um it's really important that we have spaces and and places where we can vocalize our experiences and be at the forefront of change and most importantly be in a position where we're working with organizations or think tanks um, and influential individuals to actually shape policy that's what we care about most because i think it's oftentimes we're we're listened to but not heard in a way where we can really be proactive and shape shape our education system so it can really really benefit us um i do want to quickly add in that i as a year 12 student that's going into year 13 i'm hugely hugely worried about um my future in education in in sixth form i'm worried about exams next year i'm worried about the pressure that my teachers are going to have that i will no doubt expect will trickle onto students like myself and i just really want to feel reassured that in the future moving forward that young people can be at the forefront and being involved in these sort of conversations because I've, i really feel like it's then like the any us has actually proven when young people are at the forefront then change can really be made because people in power can start to realize how it's directly impacting us so in a sense it's not even a question but it's just i'm really urging everybody on here um to pledge what they're going to do to make their organizations and their spaces more inclusive for young people 17 year olds 16 year olds 15 year olds right down to those that are in school um and even higher education i think it's just really important that that is considered and yeah i just think that's what i'm mostly frustrated about and i'd like to mostly again thank people like zara a part of enemy who made people power and the young people um supported in the position where they can actually enter a parliamentary entry um, because we wasn't able to do that. People Power have also got legal support and, and legal aid so that we can challenge the government on their breach of Article 12, which is a UN convention that explicitly states that young people are allowed to have their voices heard, but yet the government failed to do so by rejecting under 18 submissions. So constantly our own government are proven to reject us. So I'm definitely not surprised that other organisations are doing so and also people in power are doing so but I, it's just it's really 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 important and I want to urge um, people like you who are all inspirations on this panel to make sure that you reflect on moving forward how we're going to involve young people in creating this change um, and on this mission to tackle inequality really. Great thank you so much for that really important intervention and that is a reminder to all of us to not just you know bring in voices in these sorts of conversations but meaningfully um, involve young people and let them lead on change on issues that affect them. Um, I'll come back to the panel in a minute. There's one more person. Um, is it Vania? Do you want to speak? Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm a motivational speaker. Um, I left school when I was 14 years old and um, I left school because I was actually kicked out of school for having mobility 
issues. Um, and being a motivational speaker, I, um, I speak at youth centers online and I'm also um, really involved in politics and um, I'm 17 myself, but I'm not in education. I'm not allowed back into education currently due to my um, health conditions where um, most colleges and schools in my local area, they're not equipped, um, sorry, equipped enough to support me. And um, I would like to find out as young people, what can we do to ensure our future? because everyone on this panel is certainly an inspiration and when you're in university you have these um, societies and all these and all these other opportunities where people are coming in and you're engaging with people of influence politicians celebrities um, and and all these other things but when you're a young person in school when you're a young person who's doing your exams and you're frustrated you want to know where you can take the frustration out and when I say frustration, what I'm talking about is how do you turn the frustration into a movement? Because not every young person is able to protest. I know we can sign pensions, but is signing pensions enough to ensure a future for ourselves? Because you are carrying out your duty. You have a duty towards young people, which is why you're in your position. You are passionate about this. But as young people, we need to turn our passion into action. And I genuinely believe there is so, so, so much more we can do as young people. And as a young person who was kicked out of the school system, who was out, outclassed by society, who's going into youth centers online and speaking to them in order to ensure the young people do not feel left out. One of the questions that I get to hear more than anything else, and the question that I want to answer to myself is, what do we do in order to ensure a certainty for ourselves in the future? Because we just don't know enough about what we can do. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, Vanya um, and that's certainly I guess there would be a few people on this call that would be able to pick that up in terms of how um, young people can get more involved and where there are opportunities and where in fact um, we need to be creating more opportunities as well um, I'm what I'm gonna do is just take there's a question on Facebook live and a couple on q and I'm gonna read those out um, and then what I'll do is we'll just do a final um, two minutes from each of the panelists just to round up and you can pick up the questions that speak to you um, so on Facebook, um, there's a question, Kevin, I think that would go more to you um, from Rich Clark about um, the lack of procedure uh, on shutting down the school before the breakdown. Um, and there's just a, um, a lack of understanding of what the procedure is going forward now. And so just, I guess, if you could say something about what's happening in terms of where we are on school openings and government advice and how the clarity of the plan that you're hearing from government, I think that would be really helpful for, for various different people on the call. Um, there's a question um, specifically to you, Zara, um, from Laura Kay, um, which is, when I first started teaching, there were local authority behavioural support services and other things we could access. After the cuts, um, there is basically nothing. How can teachers better support these students in resource stretch times? Um, I guess you mean students that are, you know, don't fit the norm uh, of what, what is um, uh, acceptable in the classroom. I have to admit that sometimes I have found it very hard to accommodate some students in my class and in, an internal exclusion was a welcome break for me and the students. This makes me feel so bad. So this um, obviously guilt that teachers can sometimes have because they have a, a classroom of 30 plus students and they have a student that needs more support and they just don't they aren't able to do that and so you know it'd just be good if you could pick that up and maybe that's something for you uh kevin as well um and then do we have any sense i don't know jessica if you could pick up on this if there was we didn't really get any ethnicity data in the breakdown of what happened with the algorithm um why that was and if there's any possibility that that's gonna come about um in the next um, few months or if that data will be released in terms of who got upgraded even after the after the u-turn um, it'd be good to get a sense of that data just to get more transparency and what really happened or what the end um, situation is so I'm gonna um, time everyone two minutes to come back and to respond um, the question I Kevin if it's okay to start with you there was a specific question to you as well about what's going to happen on teachers, teacher racial bias um, and what any plans are there. I know that we've discussed this a bit in the past as well. 
Um, and then also for everyone to pick up on Aaliyah and Vanya's points about, about young people. So let's start with you, Kevin, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Pfizer, uh, and thanks, Denise, for the question. I haven't seen the statement from the Black Educators Alliance yet, but so what I got was a call for an investigation into what's gone wrong, guidance for teachers on a, avoiding uh, bias or uh, a look, a look at that, and how do we get how do we get to a racial justice? And I I hope that some of the things I was saying earlier on uh, speak to that. We think that you know I was talking about what went wrong this time, and I think the root of it is in the rationing of success in our system. And then we're calling for these changes to the exam system next year because it will be worse if we don't get those changes. And the question about teacher bias, we, I, I do think that, I think that's real. But I think the way to address it is to have moderation. So that's sort of double blind in the science speak, moderation of results that teachers talk about. That's not the only thing, but I think that's the thing to do at the exam, at the exam question. And I, I think we get to justice. Uh, we, we need to, you know, we know there's, uh, th there's a class justice and a racial justice element. We know that they are intertwined. Uh, we, I, I think that, so we have, to, we have to do more work on the specific race aspects and that's building an anti-racist movement. And I hope that my union is seen to be a central part of building an anti-racist movement in this country, as well as tackling those, those questions of racial, uh, of, of class injustice that we that we see and which are so closely interrelated so i hope we're playing a big part in that and i know that denise is doing that in, in her role in the union as well so uh do you, shall I, i'll leave the other questions for other people or do you want me to say oh no you wanted me to say something about school safety so that the union's overall position is we don't think the government's managing this crisis well at all we think they should have gone into lockdown sooner we think they should have a much better test track trace running but we think the virus level is low enough in most areas of the country that it is sensible for children to be back at school. But that is not the same place. It's not the same all over the country. There are places where cases are higher and rising, and it's not, not the same for every member of staff. Some members of staff are at more risk than others. So the specific question was about what happens when there is a case in a school. I read it on Facebook, and we think the government does need to be much clearer on that and we are calling for much more clarity that if there are cases then there has to be immediate testing and then there has to be people who have been close to that person have to be at home and bubbles have to be closed which was what was happening in schools before the summer break and that needs to happen now we also need a lot more clarity on vulnerable staff and we need a lot more clarity on what's going to happen in those areas of intervention the 10 or 12 local authorities currently might be a bigger number but uh in mainly in the northwest and the East Midlands region where cases are rising and the government needs to show that it can get cases falling in those areas or needs to look at specific measures in schools that can help numbers fall. I just I guess just to follow up Kevin just because this will be the um we're just sort of summing up from each of the speakers what what is the NEU's focus over the next few months I mean months I mean there's so much to do you spoke about the broader issues of you know, doing something about league tables um, and the inequalities within the system. I mean, where do you see your focus being in the, in the next few months? What is it that um, any of you will be really fighting to change? Or, or is it that you're still firefighting essentially because of the way in which the COVID um, crisis has been managed? I mean, there is so much to deal with. So there's the question of safety in return. And there's the question of making sure that schools uh, remain safe and that our society remains safe and that's going to be a big focus we've got some major initiatives that we intend to launch on that in the coming weeks then there's the question of exam fairness we think that the schools should not have to run the sats in primary school they will be very discriminatory and disruptive we uh, so that's going to be a major focus for us as well as these changes that we're seeking to a levels and gcse's next year and further changes beyond that then there's a whole set of questions about poverty and racial justice that we are we have plans for campaigning around you know um, it is really shameful that our government had to be chased by marcus rashford a footballer into acknowledging that if children need free school meals during term time 
because they're poor, because uh, their families are poor and they're in danger of being hungry, that they have to be pushed into recognising that, that should happen during the summer holidays as well. So we want to want to do a lot of work on that. There are studies coming out time after time about the effect, the growing effect of poverty. And that's obviously got a racial dimension as well. And the impact that has on widening educational gaps. So both the system of rationing and the increase in poverty, we want to be part of tackling all of those. And as well as doing all that, we've got the, the basic trades union work that we're doing. Uh, there are all sorts of questions. There's been a, a pay award. It's not binding on any schools because of the way our government organizing schools through the academization process. So we're going to be fighting at school level to make sure that our members, teachers and support staff get the pay rises they deserve, that they're not turned down on performance related pay because of the COVID crisis. So there's, there's, we've got a, a whole set of campaign plans on all those areas uh, to come across the next months. But reaching out to parents on the question of school safety uh, and, uh, and, and the examination system is going to be central for that sort of public push. Thank you so much. And just because um, obviously there was that point there from some of the young people on the call about engaging with young people and just in terms of any plans, I know obviously you're a teacher's union, um, but I guess just because that, 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 that question was asked by two I, young people. Do you know, I, I think that really matters. But I, I, teachers as, and educators as professionals, they want to empower young people. And the, some of the most inspirational things that have happened in the last years have been, the last, the last few years, have been young people's engagement with the climate movement and then with this exam, uh, exam debacle. And I think it's absolutely to be celebrated that our young people are taking those sorts of actions. So my union works as closely as it can with the National Union of Students, as well as the university and college union. I've, I've myself been to speak at student climate change demonstrations they obviously haven't been happening in, uh, because of the pandemic recently, but anything we can do to support student mobilization, that's something my union will want to be part of doing. So we've heard there, thank you. Um, so we've heard there about plans to um, address uh, racial bias in education, um, also to involve young people more and, and to um, support um, uh, young, the mobilization of young people. Great, so um, Pippa, I'm just thinking that it might make sense to come to you as a teacher hearing what Kevin said there and just picking up on any of the points. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kevin. And um, thank you to the two um, young people who, who um, spoke very eloquently. Um, and we, yeah, we definitely need to be talking to you. You are actually, that is over the last couple of years when I have seen uh, lots of young people out on the streets protesting and voicing their their concerns it does actually give me hope for the future um because young people are really taking on they've been taking on the, all the climate change issues and now taking on this unfairness in the in our exam system so that's absolutely wonderful and please keep on doing what you're doing um it's great um i just want to pick up on a couple of things obviously my my stuff is kind of local to um, where I'm working rather than Kevin is looking at the at the whole country and all the NEU and all the schools and colleges um, that he's looking after. Um, but I just want to come back on the racial bias thing because we've been bringing this up at our college over the last couple of years and we the NEU put a motion there to put some things in place in our college and this is just before the lockdown took place and what we're asking for for all teachers is is we should have some real proper unconscious bias training because it was so disappointing to get some tr what they called unconscious bias training which really involved just saying oh right we we seem to have a problem where um a lot of black boys are excluded from from schools and colleges and i'm thinking but we knew this 30 years ago why hasn't something been done about it this isn't what i came here to to do i wanted someone to make me think I wanted someone to put all this in the context of being brought up in a country which is institutionally racist and how that's affected the way you're thinking and how people like me who are, you know, want to do the right thing, but might not be doing the right thing because of 
how we've been brought up and the culture we're in. And I wanted to learn all about that and be able to question myself more. And that training was rubbish. And I want some proper training. And um, so we're talking about that. We've been talking about how we should all be looking at how within our subjects we can decolon well, obviously like the whole of the curriculum curriculum needs a decolonization but how we can look at including things in our own curriculum in our own subjects to make it to make it relevant and to decolonize it even if it's just looking at um things like in science looking at things like um why um james watson is a problem when you're talking about like the structure of dna um because he has uh he has um racist views and so things we can bring things like that into into what we're we're talking about and allow allow discussion in our classes so that's the sort of thing that um, we're looking at, at on a on a local level I'm sorry to interrupt people it's just because someone yeah. has asked a question on q a that i thought that maybe yeah sure um, just respond to as well um just about mental health and we haven't really spoken about that here but of course yeah. Um, you know, teachers with mental health issues because of what's happened, but also, of course, all of the young children and young people that have been out of school um, and now coming back into school um, and college and university. And, um, you know, you're going to have to give certain reassurances. They may have been real difficulties having been locked up at home. We know I saw something from NSPCC today about various different, you know, horrific things that that and various different trends that have gone up with kids reporting harm and the rest of it um i just wondered if there was any consideration if you've been given any advice on that if you're already starting to see the impacts of that and just if you could talk about mental health and the mental health of your students in general that'd be great thanks and that's a question from claire oh thank you claire um yeah we're, we're actually very concerned about the students when they come back and are concerned about the level of support that we're we're going to be able to offer them um, as as well that our concerns are also because we're not all because of the social distancing and everything that we're trying to get sorted out in the in the college it means that not everybody is there so there's less staff going to be actually in the college at one particular time um, and we are i mean we do have on an on-site on on-site counselor but i suspect very much and i have brought this up with management um that they that they're actually going to be overwhelmed with the demand for with students needing to actually get some help because it i think it's going to be we, we don't know how how big it's going to be yet because our students haven't come back yet but anecdotally i think it's going to from talking to some of my students and some of my students have had difficulty over the lockdown and you know i've been able to talk to some of them about how they're feeling but there is an, and i have had to refer some of them on and i've had to also refer students on after the algorithm came out and the students didn't get the grade that they wanted and i had students who were really really upset by that and talking about how this is triggering this mental health issue that i used to have and now i've triggered it so i think i think we're going to have a massive a massive problem um, we are bringing this up with our, our management we are asking we've got this terrible conundrum in that we've got which is called which is course of of course a countrywide one isn't it it's all about everything being every, everything being ruled by capital and money and you have we haven't got enough money to do this we haven't got enough money to do that do that and we've, we, we've the unions because we've got UCU working with us and Unison working with us as well. I've been absolutely adamant that when it comes to sort of saving money, we must always, always ensure that we um, keep posts for mental health workers to work with our students. Um, because just before, just before we went into lockdown, there was they were going to propose a restructure as well. Um, that's gone by gone by the board. We said we can't do that while we, we've got we've got a, lo a lockdown. Um, so we do have people at the college who can help our young people. We think they're going to be overwhelmed. We need more money to employ more of them to help them more. Basically, that's that's our situation. I'm sure our situation is similar to those other schools and colleges across across the country.
Thank you, Pippa. And of course, um, thank you for all that you do on the ground um, as a teacher and as a support to your students. Um, I'm just going to come to Zara at this point because it just struck me talking about the mental health point that kind of connects back to this to this question about the lack of resources uh, for kids that are struggling in the classroom. Um, Zara, are you still there? I'm just, sorry, I'm just, I lost you. Yeah, Zara's going to come in. Do you want to sum um, up your thoughts just listening to some of that, but also answering that question about resources? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, I, my five-year-old has just walked in. Yes. Are you doing learning games? Okay. I will, I will come and have a look in a second. Thank you. And I'm thinking about, and she, it's a good time for her to come in because she managed to do about six months of, um, of her reception year. And I'm very concerned as a parent about the impact that, this period has had on her development on her mental health i've seen her behavior um display very unusual behaviors and why wouldn't she she hasn't had contact with her peers uh she hasn't had the chance to play and learn and develop you know her, her, her learning and development was truncated in many ways we live in a small uh, we have a small home, we, have, we don't have a lot of space, no garden, um, we live in an urban area. Um, yeah, I'm very concerned actually, and I'm glad that, that uh, the question of, of mental health has been posed. And I think the, the, um, if we must go back in September, and I am really not convinced that actually we should be going back. We haven't, I don't think adequate plans have been made for return in, in this country. Um, that the mental health, mental well-being, play, belonging, nurture, all these things should be the focus, you know, as much outdoor play as possible. But I, under I understand that the, the, there are limitations in terms of um, space and class sizes. And so there's another question, Pfizer, as well, that somebody put in there, I might link them together if that's okay, that put to me in relation to not wanting to exclude children, right? Uh, but sometimes an exclusion can be like a welcome break. Nobody is saying that sometimes children don't need a break from adults and adults don't need a, ch a break from children. Nobody's saying that. But what we're saying is that we should never ever put children on the scrap heap of education and pass the buck to somebody else to sort out. Um, I think that's what we have to kind of, we, we also have to have, make a decision as educators that says, you know, these are all our children. They all belong. They, their problems are our problems. And at, and at the end of the day, society only ever gets the citizens it deserves. They're children. They're, they might, they, and, and, um, and in, this, in this particular, these times, children and young people, why wouldn't be displaying problematic behaviors? To be honest, adults are displaying problematic behaviors and that always have been. Um, and, you know, the, and we, and I, I don't want to point, point fingers, but you know what I'm talking about? When certain people admit to certain behaviors and drug taking, whatever, they seem to kind of fail upwards and get promoted. Whereas if you belong to other groups, um, you know, you'll get criminalized for, for literally for very minor, very minor behaviors that, that you know, are typical of, 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 of growing up. So to me, the, the, what we need to do going, you know, to, just to conclude is, look at the language. I don't want to see a focus on a catch-up curriculum. I think that would be the biggest mistake we can make. I think that the, the focus should be not on deficit. Children have learned an awful lot. Adults um, have, have learned an awful lot. Then there is also a lot we need to unlearn. How can we overhaul structures and systems and processes um, that don't serve us unless we are willing to come to the table and say it's time to unlearn things as well? Um, so, yes, focus on play, relationships, um, being together after a period where we've been apart so much. Um, and I mean, I, I just think it's, it's something that we, none of us has got the answer alone. I, I really think I'm inspired by the student movement and I really hope the union, I, you know, uh, can get behind in solidarity with the student movement, with young people, with people like, like Alia and People Power and others that um, they've got the answers, you know, Marcus Rashford and so on. Really hope we get somebody like that with exclusions and we can get rid of exclusion once and for all and get them out of the, of the law books. So thank you very much, Riza. Thank you, Zara. Thank you so much. And this is the best thing to do if you want to follow your campaign and help out is it to go to the website 
and the no more exclusions yeah, yeah. so no more exclusions.com on twitter is at n exclusions um yeah thank you thanks sarah Great, so I'm just gonna come, Larissa, I'm gonna end with you if that's okay. Um, just, I'm just gonna come back to you. There's a few points there. I'm sure you're gonna have loads to say, but also oh just bringing up that point about if we're gonna get any data on, any more data on sort of the ethnic minorities, but if you know anything about that, that would be helpful. That's a fantastic question. I, that's my question too, sorry, that I don't know the answer to this. I've been saying this from the beginning. I'm wondering, I'm not quite sure what the question is exactly asking because I, so I think that the, the data that was used in the algorithm is about the, literally the historical performance of a school, but that historical performance of a school or a center is, is directly correlated with inequalities of race and class. So race, 100% there would, so I don't think they would have used ethnicity data in the algorithm directly, but it's, it is included. And I suppose my point is, why didn't we use ethnicity data in an algorithm in a positive discrimination kind of way. Like, why didn't we think about an algorithm that could inter, if we have all this evidence that shows that we have a racist system, like why not in like insert it that direction the other way? Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. And hopefully we'll find out. I think some people are, I've been trying to mount some kind of case for look for freedom of information. I don't really know how to do all these things. And I don't, I'm actually not, I'm a qualitative researcher more so. so you know, um, I, under I don't understand the maths involved in this, okay? Um, and I just want to move on from that point just to say that like, in response to some things that were said, so I think Dan raised this really helpful point. I'm gonna talk about race and it's been said a lot, I think, but I want to also add that we definitely need to not conflate race with class and race with poverty and the issues associated with racism as being issues that are like of course they're directly correlated often but it's not the only thing poverty isn't the only thing that's causing the inequalities for certain minority ethnic pupils in our system um and i think on that point just that like kevin's point about the rationing of success is really important but i just want to highlight that any measure that's now produced to measure success even if it's not about rationing success the measures that we use to measure any kind of success are always likely to be racist and classist in the society that we have. Who has the ability to demonstrate their success, their potential success? It's, and so it's not even just about rationing um, or, or the rationing will just be reproduced if we're not careful. Um, and then, yeah, so anyway, I'll stop on that point in a second. But um, I also wanted to highlight this, something that I didn't get to say actually that I would really like to say I've thought of is this about mental health. During this time, I first was struck by the potential for a positive mental health for some young, be young people by, by schooling being closed. And, and um, actually I did speak into some of my friends who work in certain, like I have social worker friends. One of my friends is a social worker and spoke about some of the most vulnerable people in society who stopped having to go to school. And like, I think it's interesting in thinking about the no more exclusions as well and what happens to the excluded young people, but actually how did they experience it if, if through my own research being in certain schooling environments are so restrictive to a lot of our young people, actually was it positive for them when we stopped schooling in that moment? Um, and I really support, um, so support Zara's point about pausing education. I've been saying this from lockdown. I mean, we should have paused. We could still pause. We could be doing that to regroup. Um, and on the point from the young people, Alia and Vania, thank you for your comments and speaking. And I do believe that we need to involve young people more. For me, working um, as an academic in a university, I'm very much part of trying to do that. But I also acknowledge that I'm part of the problem because I function as an academic within a system where education is a hierarchy. So it's like I'm educating, I'm hoping to inspire young people. And through my work, I try to get young people's voices out as much as possible. But even within who I'm teaching, there's very much inequalities in which young people get here. Um, and I think for me, I'm always working within the inside, trying to support that. And my personal department are very much in that. And it's hard to know what's happening now, but 
I think that we're always trying to bring young people. So for example, I teach a module that's called Pedagogies for Social Justice. And I just wanted to say, because I felt really inspired by what you've been saying, young people. And at this moment, what everyone said about young people coming out, it was so, I felt so empowered. And you know, we talk about Marcus Rashford, but in these last few weeks, I have felt so energized and empowered by these people and actually by the acknowledgement I've suddenly realized we are here and there's a lot of us who've been through some real inequalities ourselves in education and come through feeling it and trying to get young people's voices heard and we know that their voices now are important so try, like I think that there's a collective movement towards that and more people are growing up in the system enlightened in that way and wanting to change it and we should welcome if we, those voices that are willing to speak out in a in a, on a platform so i'm i'm pleased for that and I, yeah but i think i that's why i'm a qualitative researcher first and foremost because i think young people interviewing young people and kind of kind of being able to pull that information together and put forward their views is really useful um and trying to inspire them to do it themselves sorry jessica sorry to cut you off sorry uh, yeah there's probably there's so too much, much. that's fine I mean, you know it's at a really important point like that actually whenever we do these calls and we get different people together you see that there is that there are coalitions um, and there are lots of like-minded people and we can often feel alone um you know in these and shouting at the telly and just wondering why gavin williamson hasn't been sacked and the rest of it but actually there are a whole number of us that need to come together and and work together um at this time larissa we're going to end with you putting pressure on you again to <laughs> our inspiration but I, I guess one of the things that we'd really like to hear from you as well is just how we can support young people at this time and, and, and what what you guys need thanks yeah I think before I jump into that I just want to say I think at NUS I think I speak for the student movement when I say we see all of the conversations around mental health the student mental health crisis and the, the inherent ableism in underfunding services for student mental health um, as interconnected with you know the racism in the system is interconnected with the classism in this system and so when we say we're fighting for a free liberated education system from cradle to grave that really means seeing all of this as joined up and seeing the ways that we uproot these issues as joined up too but yeah I definitely do want to speak directly to Elia and Vanya's points because I think youth agency in this conversation is so, so important. I'm 22 and the reason that I got in the student movement, got involved in the student movement rather at 16 is because I was angry, firstly, about the fact that I was seeing the ways that the education system was complicit in reproducing racism, reproducing misogyny, classism, other forms of oppression. I could go on. But secondly, because these things were presented as inevitable and unchangeable, but actually I saw the student movement as a route for turning the anger into action. And so I'd really, really encourage you to see it as yours too. And of course that, you know, this government doesn't want us to know that when we organize and mobilize collectively, we can completely change the game. It's not in their interest for us to be empowered in that way. Um, and I kind of say that by way, of a, as a, by way of a reminder that they're not gonna facilitate our conversations about how we radically reimagine education they're not going to hand justice to us so we have to build that vision amongst ourselves as students of course in conversation with workers and communities and then we need to demand that justice um, and the way that we're the only way that we ready ourselves to do that is through grassroots organizing both physically and digitally and I'm really proud that at NUS when we held our justice for education protests last week we did those digitally and physically as well because the re revolution must be accessible and I think also if we we're talking about practical routes to engaging in that organizing I would definitely recommend that college and university students connect with your local students union but also for secondary students, you know, we've seen students in Northern Ireland create the Secondary Students Union of NI amidst this pandemic. We're seeing secondary students unionizing. Can we just get a, can we just get a little clap for that? Because it's just, I'm, I'm so excited because, you know, this, this is the direction we're going in. Like, it would be an absolute joy to see students in other parts of the UK, secondary students in other parts of the UK, unionising. And I'm down to support that. So if, you're, if, if that's something you're interested in, please do get in touch. And then, of course, I've got a plug um, that people should stay in touch with us at NUS because we really do want to support 
um, students on the ground with the tools and resources that can enable campaigning around uprooting the injustices in, that this system is steeped in, but also in building that new vision for education. So I guess I, I say all of that to, to the students watching and listening, but to those of you who aren't students and, and want to support us, please, please, please do. Like We need your voices. We need you to see that we can lead, and not just we as in like uni students, we as in all the students that I have the joy of representing, students um, who have been on the ground, who said this is not okay, um, who gave us the solutions long before the results even came out. You know, we were saying the same things as workers, we were saying the same things as the other unions. You know, we were speaking with one collective voice, and I think we need to continue to do that more and more. And I'd really like to see, you know, secondary students, secondary school students, um, students in FE given a bigger, more prominent voice as we continue um, to build this movement and continue um, to see students as the voice of solutions um, for where education needs to go next. So I guess those are my final reflections and thank you very much, Faisal and class. Thank you so much for that, Larissa. Um, absolutely, you know, when you think about how little faith I know that many of us will have in either Gavin Williamson or Boris Johnson in this government when it comes to education, you know, what we've seen today is that we can, we can see within our teachers unions, within our young people, within our campaigners, education campaigners, within our teachers, that there is will work and thinking and um, solidarity that can be built across that. And that is where the power will lie. And that is where the fight re will really um, take place. It will be a matter of a coalition of, of all of us coming together and fight whatever the next thing will be, because we know there will be a next thing and we know it will be, uh, we will continue to see the various different race, class, mental health crises um, within the education system. So just leaves me to thank our speakers, to thank Pippa, to thank Jessica, to thank Kevin, Zara and Larissa so much for your time this evening. We've gone a little bit over. To thank those that engaged. Um, and just to mention this final thing, someone put on the Q&A that, um, why are we not pushing for funds to be redirected from future criminal justice and more prison building uh, into funding education properly and these are exactly the sorts of things we need to be saying we cannot accept any of the framing that is being put out there um, and and we really do need to radically push back on, on the various different um, uh, things that the government are doing on education and I know Zara's um, spoken about child prisons etc and there's, there's just so much work to be done on this so do watch out for more things that class are doing and various different papers will have out over the next few months um, and yeah just keep in touch everyone and um, thank you thank you to our speakers for in inspiring um, all of us to, to keep going and keep fighting thank you